I'd like to introduce Mike, who's a research professor in social policy research unit at York University. He, I think, has had, well, I mean, I always associate Mike with issues to do with leaving care and um, older children, looked after children in the, in the care system, and particularly championing the needs of, of teenagers and adolescents. I might not be doing service to the breadth of his work, but certainly I always see him as having been a great champion of our adolescents and, and helping us really focus on their needs. So I very much look forward to his presentation. His study was a major part of the research initiative and one of the few to have a really few internationally, I think, to have a, a, a distinct focus on adolescents in this area. So I'll hand over to you, Mike. Presentation focused on identifying the needs of adolescents, and Harriet has also referred to it, so I'll be able to build on, build on that. So in this presentation, I'm going to look at three questions. Why is teenage abuse and neglect important? What does research tell us? And I'm going to draw on two studies, a neglected adolescent study, the neglect of adolescent neglect, funded under the Safeguarding Initiative, and also briefly, another study we had, Safeguarding Young People. So in this presentation, I'm going to look at three questions. Why is teenage abuse and neglect important? What does research tell us? And I'm going to draw on two studies, a neglected adolescent study, the neglect of adolescent neglect, funded under the Safeguarding Initiative, and also briefly, another study we had, Safeguarding Young People. Services have given up too, that everybody's kind of thinks, oh my goodness, what can we do with these young people? And I think that's a real challenge for us to use the findings from research um, that Mike has, has undertaken with colleagues and think about what we might do to make a difference for young people. Now we've got a few minutes for questions. Who would like to ask something from Mike? Oh, hello, my name is Colette Elliott Cooper and I work for Essex Children's Social Care. And all the issues you've raised is really resonates with me and I really recognise them as I manage child protection services. Yeah. But because of the sort of increasing capacity and resource element, we, we find that we have to prioritise the needs of the young, younger children over the needs of adolescents. So I hope this sort of research will be fed back to sort of central government because it is a challenge for all people yeah. working in social care yeah. because those needs of teenagers are really important to us. Yeah. The, um, earlier on we talked about ad ad um, adoption. We do have a lot of adoption breakdown of teenagers and we haven't got the, the support and resources to meet those yeah. needs. And I hope this research is, will go a lot of way towards um, government funding and taking it seriously. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I can only endorse that comment. Hi, my name is Charlotte Dray. I'm a first-year PhD student at Cardiff University. I'm really interested in... The, 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 there seems to be a lot of focus on identifying neglect and creating tools and metrics and measures um, to, to better identify what neglect is and, and how we as a sort of precursor to intervention, almost a kind of gatekeep for services. And I just wonder whether we're actually looking at the wrong thing and whether we're, what actually matters is less, whether it is, you know, 45 and therefore neglect or 44 and not neglect, but actually what is it that, that works in terms of turning families round at an early intervention stage. The, my research setting um, is very effective at working at a very highly preventive stage. But the very first problem I hit with them is that they don't use the term neglect ever. And Who that's not, that? it's an Action for Children project. Okay. Okay. And um, they work at, at, with um, five to 14 year olds. Yeah. And they never, ever, ever. So one of my first kind of barriers was my research is around neglect. Well, hell, we don't use the term neglect ever. No. No. I mean, on that point, what I'd say is, I mean, clearly, um, there needs to be a recognition of it, people intervene, don't they, in, in, in young people's lives. And perhaps the first stage is bringing together the groups in an area and get them to define what they understand by neglect and then begin to thrash out, thresh out, thresh out the thresholds 
Not one to say after a few pints that. Fresh out the fresh... <laughs> the, the leaf, please dismith of us. Right, fresh out the thresholds. So that there's working definitions of when you can intervene in an area. Now, action for children. I mean, I don't know, they'll be a referral agent. They've done a lot of work on them. I'm surprised to hear that. Because they're actually, they're one of the people that's sponsoring this parliamentary debate that's taking place today or tomorrow on neglect. So I, I don't understand that. What I understand is that young people can feel troubled, they can feel ignored. They don't find neglect particularly as, as a problem. It's not a com concept like corporate parenting that's kind of not grounded. I mean, it's a thing they understand, but it's teasing it out, and that's the difficulty we had. That's why we've got five or six different groups together. And, but that, that conversation needs to be had with the children's social, social workers, the police, the, 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 the health services, you know, and work together at a ground level of... When are we going to intervene? How are we going to intervene? Is this primary, secondary? You know, that work needs to be done. Last question, anybody? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sorry. It was a piece of information, actually, rather than a question. Um, my name's Paula Telford. I'm one of two development managers in NSPCC for Neglect. Yeah. Just to mention that Marion and the UEA research was commissioned by NSPCC, so people cut from following the conference can find it on the NSPCC it is, website. Yeah. There's yeah. a link to it. It is, it is, yeah. Okay, thank you. One last question, Mike. Oh, yeah, God, I'm trying to go here. Yeah. <laughs> the lady, just there, one last question. Yeah. I work for the Youth Offending Service, and yeah. we often work with very vulnerable kids. Yeah. And we come across, you know, maybe siblings of kids that we work with who are neglected yeah. but but we find it's very difficult um, with the way that social services has changed now and the system of you know um, children on a plan and then going down to the system to maybe you know child in need or um, then t team around the child yeah. which so for some of the kids that we work with we feel actually they they need more intervention than that they've got past that stage of yeah. team around the child and particularly in cases of where we believe children are being sexually exploited. Yeah. And we all have these checklists now to check off, you know, uh, is this child showing the signs of being exploited? But who do you then refer them to? Who's going to give them the support when that order finishes that they may be on mm. uh, and we can't work with them anymore? No one mm. else seems to take up, you know, that kind of work, particularly with sexual exploitation. Mm. I mean, it's obviously an observation from yourself, but I mean, I think that the... The, the, that type of question is a very important one and it's kind of the need for really good discussion of that issue of where you are and teasing it out, you know, isn't it? It has yes, to be brought, yeah. brought together. I mean, there's, there's too many issues to go into that about that now. If you have a look at this, I mean, one of the things around youth justice is using different assessment systems, sometimes not participating in the common assessment. For, there, are, there are a lot of issues. Perhaps we can help talk about it a bit more, but they do need to be explored. Um, so I think it's a real issue, but one that has to be sought as a, a kind of a solution uh, with children's services and other groups around the team around approach to see if yes. you can get one. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Can I go? Yes, Mike. You're allowed to go now. The class is missed. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for a very interesting and informative presentation. And just to remind people who've asked questions and raised issues about help for young people, Two things really. One, obviously, this afternoon's programme is going to look at intervention in more detail, but also um, I think it's important to remember the role of the local safeguarding children boards because they are key in terms of understanding the needs of children within their areas. And also, um, he abuses me, I love him, I'll stop with him. Children desperately want to be cared and loved for, not neglected by their parents. They, that's their kind of central concern, unless things get to such an extent where they're absolutely desperate. Patterns of neglect over time. Harriet mentioned the importance of chronic, but what came out of the research review was there can be a sudden change in young people's circumstances. You can have acute neglect. And I think we began to challenge the notion that you should just think of it as a chronic condition, because that might delay intervention. Look for sudden changes in family circumstances for intervention. The, t the signs may be a young person who's previously gone to school quite tidy, um, going to school, clothes change, scruffy, 
homework not being done, situations like that, the range of situations that can begin, begin to give messages that there is a sudden change in family circumstances and not to wait, not to wait for a longer term. So it can be both chronic or acute. A lot of emphasis on whether neglect should be seen an act of omission, as in the official definition, or an act of commission. Can it be, ever be an act of commission? And when we interviewed young people, it was very clear that they distinguished between neglect where, for example, they were caring for a, an ill parent, and neglect where parents were spending the family income on alcohol or drugs <coughs> or other distractions from family income that they suffered from. So they made a distinction. They made a distinction. So sim simply just assuming as an act of commission, again, isn't always the right thing to do. A lot of debate about the, the cultural context of neglect. Um, and we found, again, from the research review quite strongly, that there's more emphasis on neglect in relation to cons or consensus around the ideas of healthy development than cultural diversity. And I think that probably follows in the, um, in, in, in the context of child abuse inquiries from Tyra Henry, um, Beckford, and other cases where um, cultural diversity was seen as a basis for non-intervention. Um, so more, a more recognition of the importance of health development. And of course, there's lots of issues about the relationship between neglect and other forms of abuse. And of course, what really matters for young people, families, is, is kind of intervention. It's not getting into long debates about whether it's psychological abuse, emotional abuse or neglect. They are important debates to have because they underpin things. But when we're thinking about um, intervention, then what matters is describing the behaviour, the consequences and the effects. So the recognition of development issues for adolescents. When I said I wanted you to get a better understanding of teenagers, I meant you to read up on child development. <laughs> I like. This isn't a typical Yorkshire social worker here, I hasten to add. <laughs> right. Um, so we looked at the causes of teenage neglect, and there was very little literature, very little research specifically focusing on teenagers. So the issues we've identified there that link to the assessment framework, you'll be familiar with these. These are the broad associations between child abuse and neglect research. These are a list of risk factors. Again, I think as Harriet wisely said, I mean, it's not so much a tick box for a series of factors, but a recognition that these may contribute. It's alerting, alerting oneself. There is an empirical base for these associations. I won't go through them, but you'll recognize them. I think they're, they're quite well known. There is a lot more need for research in relation to the etiological factors related to teenage neglect. That came out of our work and the literature review. There are big gaps. We also looked at causes to specific groups of teenagers to see, instead of saying, you know, grouping all teenagers together, we thought we'd look at the different groups. And we found there's higher rates of neglect amongst disabled teenagers. And we looked at some of the reasons why. Was this communication difficulties? There are issues maybe about being isolated, less regular services, not having skilled communication. But the critical issue was distinguish between what's the result of disability or neglect and not making the assumption, not making the assumption that everything related to disability, recognising that disabled young people can be neglected, to put it most basically. A lot of work on looked after young people, they come in. With often with a history of neglect, including physical health, emotional well-being, education. And we know from a lot of research now what works. Harriet's touched on this in her presentation. Assessment, high-quality care, compensatory attachments, you'll know. Stability, massive issue around stability, and addressing the education, health and well-being of these young people. And also supporting care leavers into adulthood is a very important area. So providing high quality care, of course we want you to have a hobby, but isn't there anywhere else you can scuba dive apart from the Caribbean? <laughs> Something that was picked up on this by the, I think it was the, that radical newspaper, the Daily Mail, I think it was, that was criticising accounts of providing holidays for looked after teenagers. Um, we also looked at other groups, we looked at young carers as teenagers, we know that young caring can increase the risk of neglect because young people are drawn into caring rather than being cared for. And they get a lack of support at key development stages. Lack of supervision may be boundaries, so there's greater risks and problems. And young people where there are severe parental problems, again, parental mental health problems and the other areas listed there, can all increase the emotional unavailability 
Um, in a way, it's almost a classical definition of neglectful parenting, low warmth and low boundaries, low control. So we're leaving young people psychologically and physically alone. We looked at the consequences of teenage neglect and we linked these to the every child matters outcomes. Do you remember these? Did you used to say these every night? <laughs> yeah. After your prayers, didn't you? Being healthy, staying safe, enjoying a cheer. Well, they've all gone, of course. You know, they've been replaced now by outcomes. Being healthy, staying safe. Oh, anyway, but, <laughs> but you don't have to recite them as much. But we linked, there was more research on the negative outcomes of neglected teenagers than we far found in relation to the causes. So the consequences. We know it contributes to poor mental and physical health and risky behaviours. Young people running away from home. Substance issues, bullying and being bullied. It's often both parts. Poor education, school record. Very kind of important that that's often picked up on early if it's particularly a sudden change. Getting into trouble. And of course all these things can have accumulative effects into adulthood. And I think that came out on the health side on, uh, on, on Ruth Gilbert's um, um, presentation, how that may manifest itself. The second study, which I'll mention briefly, was we looked at risk assessment and decision-making of a wider group of maltreated children, which included some neglected young people. It's quite a big study, empirical study, and it's referenced at the end. But what was interesting was, in this study, child protection was not seen as the most effective way to meet the needs of older young people. They were less likely to have initial and core assessment or be the subject of a Section 47 inquiry. If I had a graph, it would directly relate to age, whether those processes are used. They're more likely to follow a children need pathway and the common assessment framework. So, referring professionals, and we looked at doctors, we looked at police, we looked at children's social care, education, viewed the consequences of maltreatment to be far less serious when young people were older. They were seen as more resilient, more adult, and more able to seek help. And yet, one of the major studies in the research evidence we looked at, a Rochester follow-up study from the state, showed that the consequences of young people being neglected only in the teenage years are equally as damaging as for those young people neglected younger. But professionals, and it's a matter of I think important debate, tend to perceive the risks very differently. And I think that needs, that, needs, that needs challenging, those perceptions when we're talking about teenagers. And professionals were also influenced by the likelihood of children's services taking action and the perceived negative consequences for young people. And this, again, goes back to the negative uh, images identified often with care and children's services intervention which I think consistently need to be challenged in light of the evidence we have. It's a far more mixed and positive feature in some respects than is often portrayed. Um, that study also showed that for young people, we interviewed young people, I know there was a question about that earlier, um, what they want is often good quality sustained relationships. So the barriers were a lack of awareness of services, the consequences of disclosing abuse for the self and family, they thought that would be negative, and having trust and confident the confidentiality of professionals. But they did tend to seek help from their fears, their peers and other family members, which is interesting. So it wasn't necessarily abusing or neglectful family. They, it might be an uncle, an aunt, extended family, a granny. Massively important, that kinship network. And this has all sorts of implications for helping teenagers recognising that how their patterns, how their patterns of, of disclosure work and their patterns of help. Young people want to be seen as an individual, be listened to have a choice, more clarity about the role of professionals, accessibility and continuity of relationships, confidentiality and trust. These aren't new. Noel Timms identified these factors in the 60s, in The Client Speaks. I was taught by Noel Timms, he used to, you know, give the, give the old lecture about all this stuff, the earlier empirical work, but they've consistently been found in studies, and it's not asking a lot. But it does seem a lot that the bureaucratic parent seems a lot for them to achieve this and there are reasons why. So treated as an individual, I like this one. We like, we like to treat all our individual, young people as individuals. This, for example, is individual number 16976. <laughs> good, isn't it? Good, good stuff. Fran, Fran Orford helped to run the first leaving care team. He, he had a group of care leavers around that team. They're all ex-care leavers in Calderdale, funded by Action for Children. He's now a professional cartoonist. Yeah, so... 
He's found his nose. So the big questions then, briefly. How are we doing for time here? Good time. Fine, good, okay. Um, so how can we intervene to prevent these things happening to our teenagers and older young people? Well, clearly, universal or targeted services are very critical. Uh, there's a quote then, I think that parents, this is from a young person, do not, I think that parents do not always have help and could have had a difficult time themselves. So services promoting the well-being of families so young people aren't neglected in the first place. I mean, it's interesting about Sweden, it's not just Sweden, it's Denmark, it's the Scandinavian countries that have this, the reason they have this, they have this start with the universal services for children and they have specialist services as well. And it's that balance that is critical in, in positive social democratic structures. America start from the other end, often. Very fractured societies, communities, and then some excellent interventions. Well, I know which I would prefer, and the data on the UNICEF, the UNICEF, that's great, yeah, Tim, it's the universe data of to support that, that the Scandinavian countries have a higher sense of well-being than um, just having these pockets of sophisticated interventions. I had a big argument about this down at Dartington a while ago, so anyway, um, I won't go into that. Um, but so, prevention. Promotion or authoritative parenting, good quality attachment. We're going to hear this afternoon about interventions, what can make, can assist people. Parenting for teenagers courses. Parents are often desperate to get help. When you talk to parents, you talk to them and say, you know, I really want some help. I can't cope with Mary anymore. You know, I've had enough. I've had it up to here. Now, this is not just the ordinary. You know, I'm going to regret, I'm going to do something. I'm going to hit her, you know. I'm going to hit her again and again. I find it difficult. So, all this universal, enhance the well-being of young people in schools, school cultures, personal social health education, citizenship, colleges and employment, having supportive, it's a broader issue, it's about supportive cultures, making our society more friendly and more accessible to teenagers. How many people go on the continent and see families together, teenagers together, that more far high levels of integration? You know, it's a deep issue, it's a deep issue. And youth services and positive activities, something unfortunately that have been greatly cut by the current austerity measures, these backup services that can help at that level. The secondary prevention level, early interventions when problems first arise through informal or formal responses. Most young people can't tell anybody they're neglected. So empowering young people through friends, guides and information is critical, recognising their disclosure network. Challenging professional perceptions of risk for teenagers. The misuse. I, I've written a book about resilience, or have you included it in the book I've written. But I mean, there's misuse of resilience. It's just, oh, well, teenagers are more resilient. Well, you know, we don't have to worry about them. We'll put that aside. Um, and they're not. They can be, but they're not always. And that, the data, again, from the international data presented earlier, was, was, was very insightful. Informal responses. The common assessment framework, assessment framework, integrated working. And one thing that has proved to be evaluated to be really successful are the team around approaches, team around the child, the family, or the school, where the key workers, health, education, children's social care, come together. Tertiary prevention. And I think it's very important to recognise that for some young people, problems will persist. There's a lot of misery, a lot of suffering. There's very little UK literature on evaluating interventions on teenage maltreatment, but we know that assessment framework is very important. Having dedicated teenage support teams, say, around, and some of the some very good projects working with young people in response to general or specific issues, even they don't carry labels like neglect or maltreatment. Kids Company, although it's only in London, isn't it? Um, there's projects for young runaways, young carers, sexual young people who are sexually exploited. And these can make an enormous contribution and they need to be recognised in the team around approaches and need to be involved at that level. And many are from the third sector and that needs to be recognised as well. So the key messages are to tertiary prevention when problems have persisted. I think research suggests, if we're trying to bring it all together, ecological multifaceted approaches Seeing the young people in, in a network of their interconnected systems, that's a very strong message for me. Not, you can't just, this cannot be solved by children's services alone and by itself. Encompass individual family, community, peer group, school, neighbourhood. But the importance is that the young person doesn't get lost in those networks, that it's the quality of relationships that's 
absolutely critical. And if we talk about resilience, we have to talk about it in an ecological perspective, not reduce it to an individual perspective. And I think the key message, I was on the group, that the DFE group, Serious Case Reviews, understand, I think one of the key messages is, from the Serious Case Reviews with very vulnerable teenagers, is never, never give up. Keep, keep stuck in, because it was very interesting that many of the cases that Marion Brandon analysed, that team from UEA analysed, showed that um, the most vulnerable young people had been in touch with children's social services, often up to about two years before they became the subject of a serious case review. But they ran out. They ran out of steam. They ran out of strategies. And it raises questions about how services are organised to engage some of the most vulnerable young people in society. Whether, whether the approach we have is enough to take, take on board maybe some of the implications of having um, a primary and secondary and tertiary approach. I think probably a more focused work may be called for. That is uh, some of the references. These are all on the, all on the, on the handout. The rescoring job stick, that's worth downloading. That's safeguarding young people. Because I think the, the DFE summary is in the pack. There's the book, the book Adolescent Neglect, it should be here in the JKP. Easy read, especially if you've got trouble sleeping, I recommend it. <laughs> Not as good as a big glass of wine that I drank last night. <laughs> um, and I think, there was a, I think there was a guide, that my guide that I sent to put up, the young person's guide, has that reached the system or not? Maybe not. I don't know. I was going to show that. Anyway, it, it, if it download it, have a look at it. It's lovely. And I, I say the credit goes to this, to the young people who helped produce this guy. And it's online. It's lovely about what is neglect in very, you know, very straightforward terms and everything like that. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've got a few minutes for questions. Who would like to ask something from Mike? Oh, hello, my name's Colette Elliott Cooper and I work for SS Children's Social Care. And all the issues you've raised is really resonates with me and I really recognise them as I manage child protection services. Yeah. But because of the sort of increasing capacity and resource element, we, we find that we have to prioritise the needs of the young, younger children over the needs of adolescents. So I hope this sort of research will be fed back to sort of central government because it is a challenge for all people yeah. working in social care yeah. because those needs of teenagers are really important to us. Yeah. The, um, earlier on we talked about ad adolescent um, adoption. We do have a lot of adoption breakdown of teenagers and we haven't got the, the support and resources to meet those yeah. needs. And I hope this research is, will go a lot of way towards um, government funding and taking it seriously. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I can only endorse that comment. Hi, my name is Charlotte Drew. I'm a first year PhD student at Cardiff University. I'm really interested in, the, 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 there seems to be a lot of focus on identifying neglect and creating tools and metrics and measures. Um, to, to better identify what neglect is and, and how we, as a sort of precursor to intervention, almost a kind of gatekeep for services. And I just wonder whether we're actually looking at the wrong thing and whether we're, what actually matters is less, whether it is, you know, 45 and therefore neglect or 44 and not neglect, but actually what is it that, that works in terms of turning families around at an early intervention stage the, my research setting um, is very effective at working at a very highly preventive stage, but the very first problem I hit with them is that they don't use the term neglect ever. And that's not, that? it's an Action for Children project. Okay. Okay. And um, they work at, at, with um, five to 14 year olds, yeah. and they never, ever, ever. So one of my first kind of barriers was my research is around neglect. Well, hell, we don't use the term neglect ever. No, no. I mean, on that point, what I'd say is, I mean, clearly, um, 
there needs to be a recognition of it, people intervene, don't they, in, in, in young people's lives. And perhaps the first stage is bringing together the groups in an area and get them to define what they understand by neglect and then begin to thrash out, thresh out, thrash out the thresholds. Not one to say after a few pints that, thrash out the thresh. <laughs> the, the leaf, please dismith of us. Right, thrash out the thresholds. So that there's working definitions of when you can intervene in an area. Now, Action for Children, I mean, I don't know, they'll be a referral agent. They've done a lot of work on them. I'm surprised to hear that because they're actually, they're one of the people that's sponsoring this parliamentary debate that's taking place today or tomorrow on neglect. So I, I don't understand that. What I understand is that young people can feel troubled, they can feel ignored. They don't find neglect particularly as, as a problem. It's not a com concept like corporate parenting that's kind of not grounded. I mean, it's a thing they understand, but it's teasing it out, and that's the difficulty we had. That's why we got five or six different groups together. And, but that, that conversation needs to be had with the children's social, social workers, the police, the, 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 the health services, you know, and work together at a ground level of when are we going to intervene, how are we going to intervene, is this primary, secondary, to, you know, that work needs to be done. It was a piece of information, actually, rather than a question. Um, my name's Paula Telford. I'm one of two development managers in NSPCC for Neglect. Yeah. Just to mention that Marion and the UEA research was commissioned by NSPCC, so people can't, from following the conference can find it on the NSPCC it is, website. Yeah. There's yeah. a link to it. It is. It is, yeah. Okay, thank you. One last question. Oh, yeah. God, I'm trying to go here. I can't. <laughs> Yeah. I work for the Youth Offending Service and yeah. we often work with very vulnerable kids yeah. and we come across you know, maybe siblings of kids that we work with who are neglected yeah. but, but we find it's very difficult um, with the way that social services has changed now and the system of you know, um, children on a plan and then going down to the system to maybe you know, child in need or um, then t team around the child, yeah. which so for some of the kids that we work with, we feel actually they, they need more intervention than that. They've got past that stage of yeah. team around the child, and particularly in cases of where we believe children are being sexually exploited. Yeah. And we all have these checklists now to check off, you know, uh, is this child showing the signs of being exploited? But who do you then refer them to who's going to give them the support when that order finishes that they may be on right. uh, and we can't work with them anymore no one right. else seems to take up you know that kind of work particularly with sexual exploitation yeah. I mean it's obviously an observation from yourself but I mean I think that the the, the that type of question is a very important one and it's kind of the need for really good discussion of that issue of where you are and teasing it out you know isn't it it has yes. to be brought yeah brought together. I mean, there's, there's too many issues to go into that about that now. If you have a look at this, I mean, one of the things around youth justice is using different assessment systems, sometimes not participating in the common assessment. For, there, are, there are a lot of issues. Perhaps we can help talk about it a bit more, but they do need to be explored. Um, so I think it's a real issue, but one that has to be sought as a, a kind of a solution uh, with children's services and other groups around the team around approach to see if yes. we can get one. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Can I go? Yes, Mike, you're allowed to go now.